Okay. Um, last week we looked at virtue ethics, um, mainly from an Aristotelian point of view, although as a matter of fact virtue ethics uh, is undergoing something of a revival at the moment. Um, so uh, there's a, been a lot of thought about it, particularly in the last uh, decade or so. Um, so it's very far from a dead theory. It's, it's a very living, very vibrant theory. Um, but if you remember, we considered man's proper function and purpose in life, which is... This is your revision session. <laughs> to lead a good life. And what is a good life? Acting according to what you know is right. Yes, that, that's certainly part of it, acting according to what you know is right. Exercising reason. Exercising reason, or exercising the virtues, the virtues of both um, intellect and character, that's right. And exercising them well. It's no good exercising them and exercising them badly. You've got to do them well as well, OK? And having done this, and if you're lucky in other ways, if, if your family isn't wiped out or anything ghastly happens, what will you achieve? Eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness, but if you remember, we, we saw that that was a very bad translation, um, because apart from anything else, eudaimonia is the char a characteristic of a full life, not just of you at a time, so it's not obviously a state of mind at all, which is how we think of happiness. Um, okay, we decided, uh, well, we didn't decide actually, but we looked at the question of whether virtue is necessary for happiness. Um, I mean, could Idi Amin, for example, whom I'm assuming you would agree with me is not a virtuous person, um, could he have achieved eudaimonia? Okay, lots, lots of people are saying no, but of course, actually, he, he did die. Um, with a certain amount of wealth and his family around him and da-da-da-da. So some people may think that he's a counterexample to Aristotle. Oh, no, you really don't think so. OK, good. Uh, well, he was vilified, wasn't he, by, by much of the world. I mean, you might think that that would be a bit of a downer. Maybe he didn't um, care. Maybe he didn't care, exactly. But um, certainly Aristotle wouldn't think he had achieved eudaimonia. OK, we looked at the metaphysics and the epistemology of virtue ethics. And of course, you all remember what the difference between epistemology and metaphysics is. Can anyone tell me um, what we're talking about when we talk about the metaphysics of virtue ethics? Beyond <laughs> physics, yes, very good. <laughs> OK. She did Greek. <laughs> something that can't be sort of challenged or measured, it's just, you just know, I mean, you know. It's, it's no, that, that's actually not the case, because metaphysics is to do with truth rather than knowledge. So it would be, um, yes, what's no, Aris, no, what is virtue ethics um, a realist theory? Does it, does it see uh, moral values as, as real, as part of the fabric of the world, if you like? So does it see that there's a truth or falsehood about whether an action was right or wrong? Do you remember we discussed that? And we also looked at, if that was so, how would we know whether it was right or wrong? Because, of course, an action could be um, right and wrong in it, of and in itself, and yet are not know that it is. So how do we know that it's right or wrong if it is? And then finally, we looked at the charge that um, virtue ethics lacks a decision procedure. What do I mean by that? Can anyone tell me? It lacks a decision. What's that? Not any rules. A bit more than that, but yes, one way of looking at it, because rules make life easy, don't they? If, if, it's, if, a, if a moral theory says don't lie, then you know that all the class of, uh, sorry, all the tokens of the type is a lie are wrong. Um, that makes it nice and easy. Well, Aristotle's theory doesn't quite say that, does it? What does he say? He says there are no rules for a start. Um, so what is the characteristic of a right action? It's the action that would be performed by a virtuous person. That looks as if it leaves us without a decision procedure, doesn't it? But um, what, what did I put to you as possibly what the decision procedure would be? Ask a virtuous person, or at least ask someone for whom you feel respect, somebody who, uh, whose virtue is, is thought by you as at least as good as your own, if not better. 
yeah, you are someone you respect. OK, good. That's a little run through last week's stuff to get you um, thinking. OK, and this week we're turning to non-cognitivism. Uh, and non-cognitivism is a type of moral theory. Again, it's a type of moral theory. Although it's traceable to the views of David Hume, there are many modern-day non-cognitivists. And David Hume certainly wouldn't have called his theory a non-cognitivist theory. Although it's non-cognitivist because it's not to do with cognition, as you'll see in a minute. Um, or it, it displaces cognition from the centre of the theory. OK, um, we're going to be looking at all these things. I'll let you read those yourself. OK. If you haven't quite read them, don't worry, we will be going through them. OK, Humean ethics is the view that the right action is that towards which a true judge would feel approbation. And the wrong action is that towards which a true judge would feel disapprobation. Um, <laughs> does this remind you of anything? <laughs> does it remind you of anything? No, It reminds you of Aristotle. Why? A true judge might be a virtuous person. OK, so you may think that Hume's theory sound like, sounds like Aristotle's theory, uh, because if feeling approbation is the same as knowing what's right, and true judges are identical to virtuous persons, then, then it looks pretty identical, doesn't it? It also looks pretty useless, just, just looked at on the surface like that, a bit like Aristotle's did last week. Um, but actually, feeling approbation, as you'll see, is rather different from knowing what is right. And true judges are not the same as virtuous pe people. We, we, uh, well, we can talk later about whether you think they are. OK, there are many modern forms of human ethics. Uh, they're grouped under the title non-cognitivism. But here are a few more titles. All of these are non-cognitivist theories of ethics. And if you want to look them up and see what's different about them, there's um, a reference to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a fantastic resource for anyone who, who's interested in philosophy. It's completely free um, and uh, really very good. OK, well, Hume's ethics was built on his philosophy of mind, which is actually quite a good start, because if ethics is uh, centrally to do with action, and action is centrally to do with what? Do you remember? What's the difference between my tripping over a carpet and my pretending to trip over a carpet? Yeah. Intention. And what is it that a behaviour has to have if it's going to be morally evaluable? Uh, no, not necessarily good intentions. We, we discuss that next week when we discuss Hume. But it's got to be an action, hasn't it? It's got to be intentional under some description or other. And so immediately mental states are involved, aren't they? Um, so that a theory of ethics should come from a theory of mind is not at all odd. Um, you would expect a theory of ethics to have some sort of theory of mind attached to it somewhere. OK, but it was built on his, his philosophy of mind. And in his particular, his account of the nature of mental states, uh, he, and in particular, two he called reason and passion. Um, but we might think of as desire and belief. And there's, there's reason why we might not think of it as that. But, but that gets, gives you a good grip on it, as, as you'll see. Um, Hume was arguably the first um, philosopher of mind. He was arguably, the, indeed, the first psychologist. He was the first person to study the mind systematically and to ask things like, well, how do we classify mental states? What is it that makes a mental state a mental state of this type rather than that type, or that type rather than this type? So he, he was um, engaged in classification, which, as you know, is, is something that scientists do. Um, Arguably, he was the first psychologist. But let's, let's have a closer look at reason and passion. Uh, well, OK, to understand Hume's view at all, never mind properly, <laughs> we need to get started, we need to understand all these things. OK. 
okay, so let's start with the difference between reason and passion. Um, okay, first we've got to understand the idea, the difference between ideas and impressions. Um, Hume believed that all mental states fell into one or other of these categories. Either they're an idea or they're an impression. And ideas are cognitive states. They represent the world, they admit truth or falsehood, and they enter into rational relations. Um, actually, I've just, sorry, I'm going to go back because um, I've gone into passion and reason, whereas I meant to stick with ideas and impressions. Okay, here you are, ideas and impressions. Um, I don't want you to think of elephants. Okay, you're not thinking of elephants, are you? Okay. Actually, you are. All of you are thinking of elephants. Um, but what you'll notice is that there isn't an elephant in this room. Is there? No? Okay. No, there's not even a hidden elephant, I promise you. Okay. Now, what you're doing is you're exercising your concept of elephant. Okay. Um, I want you now to look at uh, this glass. Okay, you're now, uh, you, you are experiencing a percept, a perception, an impression, if you like, of this glass. Okay, but if you all close your eyes, you, you can no longer see the glass. You might be able to hear it, uh, etc., but you can no longer see it. So you're not uh, receiving a visual impression of the glass, but you could still exercise your concept of the glass. Yes. Could you imagine this glass being yellow? Yes. Okay, so now you're, you're splitting apart your, your concept of um, this glass and transparency, and you're putting together your concept of this glass and is yellow. Do you see what I mean? So, so the fact that human beings can entertain concepts or ideas, what Hume calls ideas, is a very important thing because without the ability to think about things that weren't, that aren't perceptually present, we couldn't form goals, we couldn't form plans by which to achieve goals, etc. So our ability to conceptualise the world um, and to, to think about things that aren't perceptually present is very important. And that's the difference between an idea and an impression. So an impression, uh, there's going to be something perceptually present to you. Uh, an idea, it needn't be perceptually present, you're ent entertaining your concept of that thing. Okay. Um, ideas are cognitive states. They represent the world, they admit truth and falsehood, and they enter into rational relations. Beliefs are the most obvious example of ideas. So let's think of I mean, belief. Let's think of the belief the cat's on the mat. Okay, so you all believe the cat is on the mat. Notice your belief represents the world as being a certain way, doesn't it? Okay, it represents the world as such that there is a cat and that cat is on the mat. So there is a cat, there is a mat, and the cat is, is on the mat. So a belief is a representational state, and it admits truth and falsehood. So if the world is the way your belief represents it as being, your belief is true, and if the world isn't the way your belief represents it as being, then your belief is false. Um, and it enters into rational relations um, in the sense that uh, if the cat's on the mat uh, and the cat's been fed, this is a bad idea, or something. Sorry, I'm the, <laughs> you don't know my cat, my ex-cat. <laughs> but uh, let me think of another one. OK, <laughs> if P, P then Q, P, therefore Q. Do you see there's, there's a set of rational relations here. You can take two beliefs, and from them, and, and together they entail a third belief. So if you believe if the cat's on the mat, and if the cat's on the mat, then it's, it's wanting supper, then what do we know? The cat wants supper, exactly. So two beliefs together entail a third. Or, or beliefs can be inconsistent with each other. They can't all be true together. So the cat can't both be on the mat and not on the mat, for example. And, and if you believe that, well, that's funny, I thought the cat was on the mat. And now I look and where's the cat gone? Um, you've got an inconsistency, you've got evidence for falsehood. Can't be the case that both of these beliefs are true. Therefore, if you, believe, if you seem to believe them both, you've got to drop one of those beliefs. So beliefs essentially, by virtue of their content, their representational content, they enter into uh, rational relations. So every belief is embedded in a logical space of other beliefs. 
Okay, so if any belief you, I mean, just think about it for yourself. Any belief you have now will be justified by certain other beliefs, and it will itself justify other beliefs. Do you, do you see what I mean? So that's what it is for a, a belief to be embedded in logical space, and it's what it is for it to, be, to enter into rational relations. Lots of different types of rational relations, um, but we've, we've talked about a few. OK, so um, Hume calls ideas reason, um, because in, vir in virtue of their representational content, they are embedded in this web of rational relations with each other. Any questions about that before we move on? What about the, the less tangible beliefs, like belief in God? Well, that's actually... Um, we're not really talking about beliefs in God. Well, actually, well, why not? We can say God... That belief is actually better expressed in the way I'm talking as God exists. So you represent... The, so if you believe that God exists, you represent the world as including in it God. OK? If you don't believe God exists, then you represent the world as being empty of God. Your belief will be true if God exists and false otherwise. And if God exists and God is... Um, omniscient, then God knows what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow. So from your belief, God exists and God is omniscient, you can derive the claim, God knows what I'm going to have, <laughs> God knows what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming, but I rather liked it when it came. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Okay. So uh, the reason I, I rather objected to belief in God is, is people... If you say you're a believer, meaning that you believe in God, um, that's a rather different thing from saying that actually everyone in this room is a believer, in the sense that everyone in this room is rational and, and has beliefs. Um, so belief in God tends to be a, a, a belief apart from others in, in that way. Um, impressions, on the other hand, are states like sensations, desires, emotions. There's something that it feels like to experience such a state. Um, so there's something it's like to see an elephant, for example. There's something it's like to be tickled. There's something it's like to be about to sneeze, etc. Um, now, these are not representational states, are they? Your, your feeling that you're about to sneeze doesn't represent the world in any way at all, does it? Um, you're, uh, and we've got to be a bit careful here because lots of people think of desires as rather belief-like. If you want a glass of water, you, think of, you should think of yourself rather as wanting to make the belief there is a glass of water, or I can drink a glass of water or something like that, true. Okay? You want to make that belief true. You have a pro-attitude towards the belief there is a glass of water in front of me, or I have water I can drink, or, or something along those lines. But do you see there's something it's like to want a glass of water, OK? But your desire for a glass of water isn't true or false, is it? There would be a grammatical error if you said my desire for a glass of water is true, whereas my belief there's a glass of water in front of me admits of truth or falsehood. But you can't say my desire for a glass of water is true, because either it exists or it doesn't exist, but it isn't true or false in the way that... OK, you're all looking puzzled now. OK, so, so let's... I have a belief there's a glass in front of me, and so do you, OK? You believe that I believe there's a glass of water in front of me, so you've got a second-order belief, but I've got a first-order belief. Um, now I've forgot. Oh, OK, the glass... My belief is either true or false, isn't it? We all think it's true, but if, if any of you are about to wake up any minute and find that you've got to go to that lecture again this afternoon, you'll discover that it wasn't true. You just thought it was true. But you see how that's true or false? Now, if I want... There, so there isn't... Usually, if I want there to be a glass of water in front of me, it's because there isn't a glass of water in front of me. It's because I don't believe there is a glass of water in front of me. But say I now want a glass of water. That want, that desire, isn't true or false, is it? It's not the sort of thing that can be true or false, a desire. Do you, do you see? OK, yes, I, can, I see you getting that a bit. So it's not... Degree? Sorry, say that again. Is, is this a matter of degree, or is there a, 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 a definite distinction? Or There's a definite distinction, because a belief... Um, if, if you think... I can't say of that chair that it's loud, can I? 
No. If, if I said that chair is loud, <laughs> um, I'd, be, you, I'd be demonstrating the fact that either I didn't understand what I meant about the chair or about loudness, because chairs are just not the sort of thing that can be loud, are they? Are you with me? Yes. The, this would be what, what gra grammar, um, people in grammar call a selection mistake. Uh, in the same way, I can say of a belief that it's true, but I can't say of a desire that it's true. Are you with me? I might say a desire is fulfilled, um, but I can't say it's true. So if, if I want a glass of water and then I get one, my, my desire for a glass of water has been fulfilled, but it's still not true because desires are not the sort of thing that can be true. Can you say the fact that you, you have a desire for a glass of water is true? Ah, yes. The desire might not be true, but the fact that you have that desire might it's be true. It's not the fact. It's, it's, that, no, that's very good, and actually it's quite useful. Um, Marianne wants a glass of water, or wants a glass of water. Remind me of your name? Chris. Chris believes... Marianne wants a glass of water. Um, that admits of truth or falsehood, doesn't it? It's the content of your belief. Yes. Do you see what I mean? But my wanting a glass of water is not the sort of thing that's true or false. Your belief that I want a glass of water could be true or false. My belief that I want a glass of water can be true or false. But my wanting a glass of water can't be true or false. You with me? Yeah. I can see you're with me now. Good. There's nothing I like better than see understanding on people's faces. That's lovely. OK, um, so um, they're not representational, uh, but a desire is a pro attitude towards making a belief true. So a pro-attitude towards having a glass of water in front of me or having a drink of water or something like that. And pro-attitudes, you, you've all had them. You have pro-attitudes toward cream, cream cakes. You wish it had stopped raining. You know, you've got pro-attitude to the sun coming out, ha-ha, um, and, and so on and so forth. We all know what pro... And sometimes your pro-attitudes are really quite strong, aren't they? You really want a cream cake or a cigarette or whatever. And other times they're, they're fairly... You will go to church because your mum wants you to, but, you know, so you have a pro attitude to going to church, but it, it's not a particularly strong one. You'd, you'd drop it like a flash if, you're, if your mum dropped it too. Um, OK, so they're not re representational. They're neither true nor false, and they don't enter into rational relations. And they can't properly, therefore, be called reasonable or unreasonable. So whereas a belief can be called reasonable or unreasonable to the extent that it's justified by other beliefs, um, a desire can't be. You either have a desire or you don't. And whether it's reasonable or not is, is just neither here nor there. Let me explain this to you in a certain way. Let's, let's say you have a child who um, doesn't want to go to university. And you really want them to go to university. OK, it's your ambition that they should go to the university, but it isn't their ambition. Um, how are you going to try and persuade them? Um, OK, now you want to reason them into a desire, don't you? OK, and I've just said that desires can't be reasonable or unreasonable. So how do you go about reasoning somebody into a desire? OK, so you're in this situation. How would you try and persuade your your child, let's make her a girl. Uh, how would you try and persuade your daughter to go to university? Talk about the consequences of the decision of going you know, at university, you will be able to find these nice things, or after university, you'll be able to earn lots of money because you've got to. Okay. So what are you? What are you, is that? What everyone would do? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. More. I mean, there might be different lures, but um, yeah. it would all be like that. Okay. What are you trying to do here? Are you trying to turn a want into a need? No, no, that's not what you're doing. Um, no, you don't want her to need to go to university. That, that would be sad. It's her that she needs to. Uh, no, that's not it anyway. Engendering another desire. Uh, cash that out a little bit. Uh, you're providing an alternative desire. Or you're providing a path to a desire they already have. Good. OK, what you've got to find in order to argue someone into a desire is to find a desire they already have 
and then show them they, that they can't satisfy that desire unless they um, form a desire. Now, if, if, let's say that you've really hit on something that she really does want. What, she wants to earn lots of money. OK, she really does want to earn lots of money. And you've just told her that as a necessary condition of going to, to university. I have to tell you, this isn't true. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to point that out. <laughs> that is, but... Yes, OK, this, uh, this is fine then. OK, where, where were we? <laughs> um, OK, so she's got a desire to earn lots of money, and you're telling her it's a necessary condition of earning lots of money that you go to university. Yeah. Now, if she, poor thing, believes you, um, she, she could do one of two things. What might she do? So she comes to believe that going to university oh, is a necessary a condition wrong. of earning lots of money. She could change her belief. Uh, uh, which belief? The belief that she didn't want to go to university. Well, that wouldn't be changing her belief. It would be changing her desire, desire wouldn't it? She, she could come to think, oh, well, if it really is the case, and Dad tells me so, it must be. And we all know that that's what children think all the time. Um, <laughs> it must be the case. It's true, because my dad told me that. Um, Therefore, I must want, uh, you know, goodness, I must go to university. I want to go to university. She'll start to want to go to university. Or... Her belief about money, want making money. Um, will it be her belief she changes? Desire. desire. What might she do? Not desire. Not she might just lose her desire to, to make a lot of money. She might think, ooh, well, if that's true, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I'd rather go on... Um, be a philosopher instead, or, or something like that. <laughs> Although it is actually necessary to <laughs> go to university for that. Do you see what I mean? If, if you, in order to, you, we think about arguing people into desires, but what we do is we provide them with a, a belief that desiring one thing or achieving one thing is a necessary condition for achieving something we know they already want, and we hope thereby to cause them not reason to cause them to want this other thing. But we might come a cropper if they decide actually to drop the first desire rather than uh, adopt the one you want them to adopt. Do you see what I mean? You actually, if somebody really does not want something, there's nothing you can do to argue them into wanting it because wanting isn't a, isn't a rational process. You either want something or you don't. If she doesn't want to go to university, if she really doesn't want to go to university, then <coughs> nothing you can say is going to persuade her uh, because it's a desire is not that sort of thing. You with me? OK. So Hume says, it's not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my little finger. OK. Do you see what he means? If, he, if it, that's really what he prefers, then there's nothing irrational about it because desiring isn't either rational or irrational. It's non-rational. Are you with me? So irrationality is a failure in the house of reason. So you can't be irrational unless you're rational. And if uh, desires can't be rational, they can't be irrational either. Desires are non-rational. Okay, they fall in between. Right, OK. So now, do we understand the difference between reason and passion? Any, any questions to be asked about that? So reasons are representational states. They represent the world in being, as being a certain way. They admit of both truth and falsehood. Uh, and they're embedded in a logical space of reasons. Logical because it, they're rational relations that pull them together. OK, so physical space is constructed of physical relations, like on top of, in between, next to, and so on. And logical space is constructed of rational relations, like entails, is consistent, follows from, etc. OK, um, and passions, or desires, as I've been calling them, rather, I mean, there are a lot of philosophers who would be a bit fed up with me calling passion desire, but, but it, I think it makes it easier to understand. Desires are not embedded in reasons. They're neither rational nor irrational. They don't admit truth or falsehood, and they're not representational. So two totally different types of mental state. 
So this, this is, remember, this is Hume classifying mental states into types. So beliefs are one type of mental state and desires are another type of mental state. Reasons are one type of mental state. Passions are a different type of mental state. And Hume, OK, we need to know how this fits into Hume's claims about morality. Well, Hume believes that there are only two types of reasoning as demonstrative reasoning and probabilistic reasoning. So when we're engaging in, in reasoning, when we're trying to derive some beliefs from other beliefs, these are the two types of reasoning that we engage in, these to exhaust the types of reasoning available. So demonstrative reasoning for, in forms of, of the relations between various ideas. So, OK, uh, well, I've given you the answer here, but can squares be circle, circular? I should say. How, how do we know this? It's in their definition. Yes, OK. We, tr we entertain our concept of square, and by that I mean we all, know, we all know, remember, a cognitive state, what it is for something or what it would be for something to be square. OK? And then we entertain our concept of circle, um, uh, our knowledge of what it would be for something to be circular. And entertaining those two pieces of knowledge, we see that actually these two things are contradictory. Mm -hmm. You cannot have something that is both square and circular. OK? You, you, we know this, don't we? We only have to look, our, look at our concepts to know that. Um, and also... Um, Yes, I'm no longer sure of these two. I'm going to go over those two. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, I hope you see what I mean about demonstrative reasoning. Um, you, if, you get, if you see that this belief and this belief can't both be true without this belief being true, that's demonstrative reasoning, deductive reasoning. Okay? Um, probabilistic reasoning um, takes us from one experience to something, an expectation, if you like, about future experience. So it it's informs us about causes and effects. So if in your experience, doing A has always been followed by the advent of B, then doing A, you will expect it once again to be followed by B, um, the advent of B. OK, so, so you're, you're either thinking probabilistically or inductively. So you're, you're going from your past experience to make predictions about your future experience. Or you're looking at the relations, the deductive relations between your ideas. OK, so only two types of reasoning. Um, but in the absence of a desire for something, anything, Neither of these types of reasoning is going to prompt any sort of action at all, isn't, is it? So, so if I engage in deductive reasoning, I think, OK, uh, goodness, I want a cup of coffee. Um, the best way of getting a cup of coffee from here, um, well, is to wait for an hour <laughs> and then go into the common room, yeah. OK? Um, or I could nip down to the shop just down the road and get one, but that would be leaving you da 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 da. OK, I, I do want a cup of coffee, but I also want to give the rest of this lecture, etc. Um, so my reasoning about how I would get a cup of coffee isn't going to move me anywhere unless that want for a cup of coffee becomes so strong, I'm prepared to just leave you lot here and, and go off and get one. Um, and in exactly the same way, I, I can reason as much as I like about cause and effect, saying doing this will, will achieve that. Um, but until I want that, the reasoning isn't going to take me anywhere, is it? And what Hume is saying is that reason is non-motivating. We, we only act if we have a desire for some end. And he claims that reason is the slave of the passions. It's the passions that move us around the world. All reason does is tell us how to achieve our, how to fulfil our desires, how to get what we want. Um, so reason is the slave of the passions because all reason does is inform us how to achieve our ends. With me? You agree? You all agree, do you? Good, okay. 
That means I'm going to enjoy next week. Right. On the Hume's account of reason and passion, um, they play different roles in our psychology. Um, so not only are uh, beliefs and desires, reasons and passions distinguished in the ways we've already looked at, they also have different functions in our psychology. They, they play different roles in the production of our behaviour. Um, so whereas reason... Um, well, if you think of uh, desire as lighting the blue touch paper, those of you who are old enough to know about blue touch papers, um, uh, that's what desire does. And belief is the guidance mechanism. It guides the missiles, which is where the analogy with fireworks falls down, I suppose. OK, so reason informs us of matters of facts and relations between ideas, but passion is what motivates us. We don't do anything until we have a desire. I'm sorry, what's your name? Peter has just given me another counterexample, but here's one. OK, some people say, well, when I gave up smoking. It's not that I wanted to give up smoking. My goodness, I wanted to carry on smoking. I really liked smoking. But my reason told me to give it up. Okay. Do you see how that's structurally exactly the same counterexample as Peter's? So what Peter is saying is, is that it was his reason that caused him to send the money electronically. If I ask you, to, no, you wouldn't have the same sense of duty, would you? Um, <laughs> Yes, but surely the reason was they, you want to be healthy. That's, I mean, that's, you know, you desire to be healthy, don't you? I mean, and that's why reason okay. tells you give up smoking. Erica is absolutely right. <laughs> what, what she's suggesting is it's not reason that tells you to give up smoking. It's your desire yes. for something that's inconsistent with smoking, that your reason tells you is inconsistent with continuing smoking, which is... You, you desire health. So you desire that cigarette uh, or that cream cake or, you know, choose your own personal um, desire. But you also desire um, health, fitness, slimness, whatever. Um, so you've got two desires and reason is, is telling you, well, you yeah. can't have both. You've got to make this or, or this decision. If you do this, you won't achieve this. If you do this, you won't achieve that. And then you've got a second order desire. Which one do I want most out of health and smoking? Does that answer your question? Yes, I can see. Yeah, yeah. And it's exactly the same here. So, so Hume would claim that this isn't a counterexample. What he does do, though, is he distinguishes between the calm passions and the violent passions. Um, so desires for things such as life, health, etc are calm whereas desires for things like cream cake and smoking are violent and i think we can see his difference can't we um you know you don't even, you don't really think of yourself as wanting health it doesn't come into your mind as a desire you have whereas the desire for a cream cake or a chocolate biscuit or whatever really presents itself to you as a, as a desire doesn't it but but we might says hume mistake the calm passions for for um reason because because they're calm there's it's less obvious that there's something it's like to have them um, so you may not notice them and just think of yourself as reasoning. So are, they, are the violent passions stronger than the calm ones? There's, there's more obviously something it's like to have them. If, if we take smoking as an example, I mean, most young people nowadays are bound to know that smoking is not good for their health. Yeah. Yet a lot of them smoke. Well, it doesn't stop them wanting a cigarette. Um, I mean, if you're a smoker, um, I, I get the impression that, that you can know, OK, knowledge is the cognitive state. So you, you, there's no doubt whatsoever that you believe smoking is bad for you, but it doesn't stop you wanting a cigarette. Um, and that, that's the characteristic of a violent passion. But of course, you want health as well. Um, so here you've got two desires coming into conflict, um, but there's nothing your reason can do to, to adjudicate there um, because it depends how strong your desires are as to which one is going to get acted on. I, I'm actually proposing that, that, that calm desires are always desires for things that are good for you 
and violent are, are, are bad for you? Um, not necessarily. Go on. Go on. Can you think of one that isn't? And the calm passions, uh, they tend to be things that are, that are part of the structure of life. If, if I'm jolly hungry, cream cakes could be quite good for me. That's true. Yeah. Yep. No, that's absolutely fine. But I mean, still the desire for... Uh, passions. I, I'm not going to answer this question, because actually you can answer these questions yourselves. If you've understood the difference between calm and violent passion, if you see what I mean when, um, or see what Hume means when he says calm passions can be mistaken for reason, whereas violent passions can't be, then you can work out yourself whether of a given passion. But I mean, the desire for life could become extremely violent, I should imagine, under wow. certain circumstances. Um, the desire for life could, could become absolutely overtaking if, if you've got a car coming towards you fast. Um, the desire for life will be... It seems a slightly subjective distinction. It's a totally subjective distinction because it's, the, it's a distinction between how states of desire seem to a subject. I mean, there's nothing wrong. There are objective facts about subjective states of affair. Don't, don't think, oh, subjective. Pfft. You know, we, we'll dismiss that. It's nothing but subjective. You are a subject and you have states that are... Um, that only you, as the subject of these states, are... Uh, sorry, they are only accessible to you. There's nothing wrong with that. OK, objective is good, but there are objective facts about subjective states of affairs. OK, um, so Hume thinks it's easy to mistake calm passions for reasons uh, because experiencing them isn't so obviously experiencing a qualitative state, having an experience of some kind. OK, but what's all this got to do with morality? That's what we need. So, so far, we've been doing philosophy of mind. We've been looking at uh, reasons and passions. We've been looking at how, their how a mental state is classified as a reason or as a passion. And we've seen that it's going to have lots of different properties, which will put it in one category or another. And it's going to play a different role in the production of behaviour, which also puts it in a different category or other. OK, but what's all this got to do with ethics, which is what we're here for, after all? OK, well, morality is essentially active, isn't it? Uh, moral beliefs motivate us essentially. It's of the essence of a moral belief to motivate us. So do you think that you can believe that doing A is wrong without thereby believing that you shouldn't do A? Now, I'm not saying without thereby, believe, by, thereby not doing A, OK? All of us have had the experience of doing something we believe we shouldn't have done or not doing something we believe we should have done. Um, but then your belief that you shouldn't have done it is going to be manifested in guilt, isn't it? So to believe that doing A is wrong is to be motiv motivated not to do A, isn't it? It's to have a reason not to do A. Isn't that right? Yes. OK, it's to want not to do A, even if you don't actually act on that want. So, so motivation, action, is absolutely central to morality. If your ethics doesn't engage with your behaviour, what are we all going to think? So you tell me you believe lying's wrong, but I catch you lying every five minutes. Yeah. What, what am I going to think when you say, say one thing and do another? What do I believe? Uh, well, uh, yes, I believe that you're not trust me, but, but um, I forgot what I was going to say, actually, but uh, you always believe what people do, don't they? Mm. Not what they say, it's mm. what they do that matters. And that's because morality essentially engages with your action. And if it doesn't engage with your action, then you may be paying lip service to it, but it isn't your moral beliefs, OK? So morality and action go together like that. Um, OK, bleh, I think I've said that. OK, so to believe lying is wrong is to believe we shouldn't lie. That belief, we shouldn't lie, is intrinsically motivating. You can't have that belief without being motivated. Um, and this move from is to ought, the shouldn't there is, is the ought, um, indicates a move from fact to value. OK, and values are essentially motivating. 
And I'm not saying that there are no facts about values, which is something Hume might have said, but um, we, can, we don't have to address that here. Um, so if beliefs are causally inert, okay, and what Hume takes himself to have shown is that beliefs are not implicated in the production of your action, or at least they're not, moti they're not uh, implicated as motivators of your action, so you can have all these beliefs and not be motivated at all, okay, so beliefs are causally inert, then moral judgments, lying is wrong, etc., can't express beliefs. Okay, so what, what's he mean by this? Okay, consider the statement lying is wrong. Now, that looks like an expression of belief, doesn't it? If, if you say lying is wrong, then I, it, I would usually understand you as expressing a belief, a belief about the world, in particular a belief about a certain type of action. So what you're doing is you're um, picking out um, a certain class of actions, the class of lyings, and you're saying these actions are wrong. OK, so it looks as if you're, um, there's a representation of the world, isn't there? There's a representation of the world as containing uh, actions of a certain type. You call them lyings. And you're attributing a property to these actions. You're saying these actions are all wrong. OK, but if keeping promises is right, again, you're picking out a certain type of action and you're saying of actions of that type, that they're right. Again, you're attributing a property to a thing. So we surely have a straightforward subject predicate sentence here. Just as you're saying of the cat that it's on the mat, you're saying of a lie that it's wrong. So just as being on the mat is a property of the cat, so being wrong is a property of lying, isn't it? I mean, surely saying lying is wrong is a belief. And what's more, um, it could be true or false. I mean, lying is wrong. Um, we probably would all say that that's true, um, at least as a general claim. We may want to start quarrelling, as uh, we've seen at the edges and so on and so forth. But on the whole, you've all brought your children up, haven't you, to believe that lying is wrong is true. So how can this not be a belief? It's a representational state. It admits of truth and falsehood. Uh, and it's embedded in a logical web of other beliefs. Why, why do you think lying is wrong? Can you explain to me? Is it, is it just, do you have no reason for thinking that lying's wrong? Because if everyone did it, the world would sort of... Ground to a halt. <laughs> yep, if everyone lied, uh, communication would be impossible. Yep, okay, so the perfectly good reason. So, um, if you believe that, then you will believe lying is wrong. So it's embedded in a logical space as well. Surely, lying is wrong has got all the characteristics of a belief, doesn't it? Can you not qualify it by saying lying is usually wrong? You could do, um, but it, it's still got the characteristics of a belief, hasn't it? But yeah. Let out. Uh, no. Um, it still looks like a belief, and, and that's what Hume is pointing out. We all think that, that uh, when we express, uh, sorry, things like lying is wrong, we are expressing beliefs. But there's a big problem. If beliefs are not motivating, then that can't be a moral statement. It can't be a moral judgment. So lying is wrong, says Hume, may look like a belief, it may seem to admit of truth or falsehood. It may appear to be embedded in a web of reasons. But as it motivates us, and essentially motivates us, it must be a desire. Do you see what I mean? When we look, or, or I, this is where I think passion would have been a better word, we look at a lying and we think basically, yuck, okay, or boo. Um, we feel disapprobation when we think about lying. That's the core of our moral um, sensibility, 
if you like. It's not that you see that an action has a property. It's rather that the action strikes you in a certain way. And that subjective feeling you have of, of disliking the action is the core of what morality is about. So some have called Hume's theory an error theory because it claims that our belief that moral judgments are beliefs is simply false. It is an error. Um, morality is not to do with cognition. It's not to do with reason. It's to do with passion. It's to do with our feelings. It's to do with um, the way things in the world strike us. Not, we're not just looking at an action saying it's got the property of being wrong. We're looking at an action and it's causing in us a feeling. And that's what makes us think it's wrong. Not that it's got a mind independent property of wrongness. The, the, the thing that's missing seems to be the statement is that we shouldn't do what is wrong. I mean, lying is wrong in that sense. It's just a statement. But then the corollary of that is you feel somehow you shouldn't do what is wrong. Um, well, that, that was being used by me to show why the, be the apparent belief lying is wrong is intrinsically motivated. But you can't believe lying is wrong, can you, without believing you shouldn't lie? Well, you, you could believe that lying is perfectly acceptable, presumably. No, no, but we're not talking about that. If you believe lying is wrong, you will believe you shouldn't lie. That's what makes li uh, the, yeah. the apparent belief lying is wrong intrinsically motivating. But if it is intrinsically motivating, says Hume, it isn't a belief at all. It's, it's a passion. See what I mean? So, so very interesting here, because Hume's really under, undermining um, our sort of knee-jerk thoughts about morality in quite a big way. Um, so he thinks that if we think the statement lying is wrong is a description of the world, an objective, if you like, description of the world, um, then we're wrongly projecting our own feelings onto the world. Actually, when we see an, an action is wrong, it's because it strikes us in our feelings and passions in a certain way. It's not because the action has a property that would exist independently of us. Now, if we accept Hume's account of mind um, and the resulting account of moral judgment, um, then we've got a problem if we also liked Aristotle. And I know that a lot of you liked Aristotle last week, so now you've got a problem. Um, according to Aristotle, when we act morally, when we act not only for reasons, but for the right reason. Yes. And if Hume is right, reason doesn't come into it, does it? it it's how we feel. It's, it's um, our passions. So according to Hume, it's not our reason that prompts us to act morally, it's our passion. Um, OK, well, let's, let's talk about this for a while. So do you, do you agree with Hume that moral motivation requires a passion or are you more with Aristotle in that morality requires passion to be overcome by reason? What do you think? Well, I'm Aristotle. Myself. Right, Eric is Aristotle. I'm Hume. You're Hume, OK. Well, let's, have a, let's have a quick uh, Hume. OK, Aristotle. OK, we're almost evenly divided, but possibly Aristotle's got it. OK, well, tell me, tell me why you're with Hume, Peter. Well, I, I think because he includes passion, uh, which I think Aristotle rather excluded. And um, I think passion is important. OK, and why do you think passion is important? Do you think Hume's right about why passion is important? I, I think because you've argued the case that, um, very well in the sense that um, actually passion yeah, it was Hume's argument sorry. rather than mine. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Anyone else want to um, support Hume? Why? Why you with Hume in this? Hume seems to be saying that, in reading about it, that we confuse is with ought, and that we therefore, what we say, the way the world is, yours. You're actually saying this is the way the world ought to be. 
and that we confuse, and therefore we need a, a passion to make it the ought. Yes. As opposed to a reason to make it an is. Yes, that's right. I mean, Hume gives an example of a, of a sapling that, that rises up to, to overtop its parent's tree, thereby killing it. So we see exactly the same relations, don't we? Reason tells us it's exactly the same relation as the relation of um, matricide or patricide. Um, but we don't feel any sense of disapprobation when we see it happening with the saplings, whereas we do feel disapprobation when we see it with human beings, the, the child killing the parent. Um, so he thinks that it's not the relations in the world, it's not the properties in the world that are important, it's our responses to these properties that's important. It's how we feel about them, how they strike us um, em emotionally, um, in a way. Well, also, just as an additional thing, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't say that you don't need reason. You do need reason mm. yes, to, you're to, to right. interpret your motivations, but it's motivations which are the, it's the passions which are the motivating things in the first place. You're absolutely right. Um, when he says reason is the slave of the passions, he's not actually suggesting that reason isn't involved in the, in the production of action. It is. But it is the guidance mechanism, not the, the lighting of the blue touch paper. That, that's the difference. So both of them, both reason and passion are involved in any action at all, um, if it's an intentional action anyway. Um, but it, it's passion plays the role of motivating. And as moral judgments are essentially motivating, they must be passion rather than reason. That's, that's the idea. You can reprogram your passion. Ah, well, let's come on to this now, because um, there's a big problem for Hume, and that is that it seems to commit us to believing that lying is wrong means little more than I don't like lying, or when I see lying, I feel disapprobation. Um, do you see what I mean? Lying strikes me as horrible, therefore lying is wrong. Well, that seems to be a highly subjective view in a... In a sense of subjective which is disapproving um, because on the whole we don't want our moral beliefs to be subjective or what we think of as our moral beliefs to be subjective um, so if if Hume's right that there's nothing more to lying is wrong than that we don't like lying then surely there's something wrong here with his theory of morality well that's because we actually um, OK, so there's, there's a question. So is that what his claim is? This is a problem for him, or it would be a problem if that's what he's claiming. So is this indeed what he's claiming? Um, and to see that it isn't, we've got to look at his positive view of morality. So far, we've looked at his negative view of morality, um, what he thinks morality isn't. Now let's look at what he thinks morality is. Um, he secures a sort of objectivity for moral judgments by requiring that before an expression of approval or disapproval or approbation or disapprobation, as he puts it, uh, can be deemed moral, it must be made by a certain type of person. OK, you, so it's not that every person who um, looks at something and says, whoa, that's wicked, um, is thereby making a moral judgment or should be understood as making a moral judgment. The only person whose approval or disapproval is properly moral, according to Hume, is a true judge. And that's where the true judge comes in. Do you remember we looked at whether this was like Aristotle's virtuous person? OK, a true judge is a person who's adopted a stable and general perspective on an issue. OK, so we need to know what a stable and general perspective is. Um, so how do we become true judges? How do we adopt this stable and general perspective on an issue? Or if we're parents, how do we encourage our children to adopt a stable and general perspective on an issue and thereby become the sort of people who, whose um, moral beliefs tr or, or beliefs are truly moral? Passions are truly moral, I should say. Um, to become true judges, we've got to move from what Hume calls pre-moral deliverances of sympathy to truly moral attitudes. OK, so we've got a distinction between pre-moral deliverances of sympathy uh, to truly moral attitudes. OK, um, when we experience or, or when we empathise with others, when, the, when there's a knee-jerk, immediate feeling of empathy, Hume calls that a pre-moral 
um, expression of sympathy. If a child cries because her friend is crying, for example, she's experiencing such a state. So you all know what it's like. If one child in the nursery starts crying, the next thing you know, they're all going to be crying. <laughs> Um, and that suggests that there's a natural sympathy between people. If, if I were to hit somebody very hard, you'd all sort of, there'd all be an immediate sort of movement back on of sympathy um, on all your parts. Um, because actually we're extremely good, aren't we, at em empathizing with other people on the whole. We, we do feel each other's pain. Normal human beings do feel each other's pain in all sorts of ways. And it takes quite a lot to, to knock that out of someone. Um, to become a true judge, we need more than the ability to empathise. We do need the ability to empathise. That, that's essential. Um, but we need a great deal of knowledge about the nature of the world and about the causal relations that obtain in the world and about the things like the good for human beings, etc. So, I mean, we all sympathise when we take a child to have its, in, uh, have its vaccinations or something and it cries and, and we feel for it, don't we? But we still do it. Um, we still take it in there and, and make it have its injections. We still take it to school when it doesn't want to go to school. We don't allow our empathy to get in the way of what we see to be right about what we're doing. So acquiring this knowledge is a natural process. Um, we learn that if we eat a lot of ice cream, we'll get sick. Um, so when our child starts screaming because it, you've said no to it's having an ice cream, but it's already had two, so perhaps you're at fault already. Maybe it's just had one. Uh, but you don't give it another because you know it's going to get fat, you know it's going to get high cholesterol, you know it's going to get this, you know it's going to get that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we learn that if we hurt our friends, we're going to lose them. Um, we learn that things are not always as they seem, you know, that appearance and reality can come apart and so on. And in learning all these things, um, we learn um, the better to apply our empathy, don't we? We learn when it's reasonable to, sympathy, to sympathize and when it's not, or when we should act on our feelings of empathy and when it isn't right to act on our feelings of empathy. I keep saying reasonable, but I, I've got to be a bit careful here um, because you see what we're trying to do is, is merge, or not merge, but, but um, educate our feelings of sympathy, educate our feelings of empathy. Um, another thing we learn is that we're just one person amongst many. Um, so something that strikes me immediately as, as wrong um, may actually not be wrong. It may be that from everyone else's perspective, it's not wrong. So the fact that it strikes me immediately with a sense of disapprobation, you know, oh, he's taken my doll. Um, so I start screaming that this is wrong and not fair and da-da, da-da. But actually, you learn that you're one amongst many others, and that teaches you that actually maybe it's not right that you're feeling disapprobation is evidence of injustice, for example, in this case. We also learn that we can be wrong. So we become true judges only when we've extended our natural ability to sympathize. So we acquire the desire to consider every action from the perspective of all of those who are going to be affected by it, OK, not, not just ourselves, not just um, those who are close to us. We, we think of everyone who's going to be affected by the action. So anyone who doesn't think like that, anyone who considers only themselves or only the, the immediate people is someone who hasn't yet learnt how to adopt a moral perspective on the world. Um, and we also need to um, wait to decide whether we approve or disapprove until we've considered it from every perspective and until we've, our view is stabilised, because you all know what it's like. I mean, let, let's take as an example the giving of votes to prisoners. Um, well, when you first read that, I bet most of us had quite a strong intuition one way or another, did we? And, and being sensible people, we've all been reading the leaders of our uh, newspapers and we've always listening to the radio and we've listened to John Humphreys and everyone else and if, if you're like me you're still I haven't achieved a stable perspective on this yet I, I'm almost everything I read I change my mind because uh, it seems to me that there are good arguments on each side so I don't claim as yet 
to be in a position to make a moral judgment about whether or not prisoners should have the vote. Do you, are you with me? So what I'm trying to do is, is put myself in a position where I can claim to have a moral perspective. Uh, it's when my sympathies are, have reached a stable and general perspective, when I've, I've taken in everything that I think I can take in and my sympathies have stabilised um, on one side or the other. Are you with me? So do you, I mean, maybe it's too specific, but in that particular case, do you ever feel you could get to that position? Mm. I mean, I, I, well, in that particular case, I, I could come to, I mean, I had my own view on it, but it would be a pragmatic decision. I, I, I think that, uh, yes, exactly, it wouldn't be a moral decision. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's exactly so. I, I think until... Uh, what, what Hume would say, or, or what non-cognitive would, would say, would be until you've reached the point where you feel that you've reached a stable and general perspective, you have to hold back from making that moral judgment. You're not yet in a position to make the moral judgment. You see this, I mean, you're in a position to say, well, there's this and then there's this, and if this, then I say no, and if this, then I say yes, and da-da-da-da, da, da, da. but you're not actually yet in the position to make a moral judgment. You might be forced to make a decision, um, and, and actually, I think many of the decisions that are made, I mean, the government is forced to make decisions all the time, isn't it, on a pragmatic basis? Um, and probably often, usually, always, perhaps, before it's in a position where it can make a moral judgment. And, and any actually thinking person is going to see that and, and see how difficult it is to get into that position, because we all know if we're intellectually honest, that it's actually very difficult to get into that situation. Aren't you in danger of using this as an excuse for never making a decision? Um, well, as a philosopher, I'm inclined to say making decisions is dangerous. But, did, did you but I think that one shouldn't make a decision unless one has reason to make that decision, um, unless one's forced to, uh, and quite often one is forced to. And in life, one is certainly forced to. I mean, if you're facing a moral dilemma, if, if your mum's saying, you know, what, what do you think? You've got about 10 seconds to make up your mind between being kind and being honest. But, but, but I would argue is actually, even though you're not forced into making a decision on whether prisoners have the vote or not, it really is quite important to come to some sort of uh, well, decision on the matter. So, you know. But do you think it's important to come to a decision because, for pragmatic reasons, a decision has to be made? There's no doubt whatsoever if about that. If you don't that. make a decision, you can never influence what happens in, in government, for instance. Yeah. If everybody says, I don't know. I, I completely agree, and there are very good pragmatic reasons for making a decision even though you haven't made a decision, if you see what I mean. I mean, that's the situation, isn't it? You, you say you've made a decision even though actually you can see both sides. And I mean, sometimes we do that to a fault, don't we? We say we've made a decision when actually we're quite, actually quite a long way from making a decision. And well, maybe you, you don't ever do that. I have been known to be very definite about a position that about three minutes later, I think, Actually. <laughs> um. So Beth, to extend that, did Hume consider that true judges actually exist, mm. either for a particular case or, or as someone who is a true judge and he's got the gold star, or is it, <laughs> is it hypothetical? It's a, it's a state which you could imagine, but maybe you never ever agree. Well, we, and we can ask exactly the same question about Aristotle, can't we? Yeah. Are, are there any people who, who are virtuous? Yeah. I mean, maybe this is just an ideal state. What we're saying is that an action is right if, if it would have been performed by a virtuous person, if there were any virtuous people. Yeah. An action is right if it would have been approved of by a true judge, if there are any true judges. Maybe all of us are, maybe this is like the situation in mathematics when we say we always tend to infinity, we never actually get there. Maybe we tend to true judge them without getting there. I'm assuming that um, both of them didn't actually say that. No, yeah. no, not that I know of. I, I mean, again. Um, Isn't it also based on universals rather than... In what way? Well, rather than recognising that in different cultures, different knowledge 
that knowledge will be different. Knowledge is not absolute. Um. We, we went over that, if you remember, in the second week, or was it the first week, when we looked at absolute and relative knowledge? Uh, sorry, absolute and relative truth. Um, and you could... I mean, a tr if moral truth is relative, then a true judge would make judgments on that basis. And if knowledge is... If, sorry, if moral truth is absolute, then a true judge would make... But we're not going to judge that, we're not going to prejudge that issue, but you might want to go back and have a look at absolute and relative truth that we did in week one. Any other questions on that? Let, let's move on a bit, because we're... Okay, so if we allow bias to cloud our judgment or we ne neglect to consider somebody, um, our attitudes of approval and disapproval are not going to qualify as moral attitudes. Um, we all know, I mean, sometimes when we, when we look at um, these campaigns to get pedos off the street and things like that, we might think that this is an indication of, of a pseudo-moral attitude. And I'm sorry if that offends anyone, but do you see why I'm saying that might be a pseudo-moral attitude? Um, a lot of these knee-jerk campaigns... Um, it's very difficult to resist the thought that they haven't been thought out, that they haven't been looked at from different angles, they haven't been looked at objectively, we might say, if we were just in bar conversations. And what we're, we're appealing to here is just we can see why the outrage is caused, we can see where the um, um, disapprobation is coming from, but we can also see that it's perhaps misdirected or, or that it's not being used properly, um, that it's being misused. Um, and it's that sort of thing we're, we're looking at here. Um, so if and when we do succeed in adopting a stable and general perspective, um, there are modern Humeans, and Simon Blackburn, for example, I, of whom you may have heard some of you, um, he calls himself a quasi-realist, um, and he thinks that um, non-cognitivism can actually earn the right to think of moral judgments as true or false, even though they're not, um, when they're judgments made from the stable and general perspective. So, um, going back to, to where Hume is, so when we say of an action that it's right, Hume says that we're not saying that that action has a property of being right and it would be right whether anyone was there or not. We're, if we say that, we're projecting our own feelings onto this thing, okay? And what Simon Blackburn and other non quasi-realists are saying is that actually, if you've educated your, your feelings of approbation and disapprobation properly, so you've become a true judge, then actually when you look at an action and say that it's right, you've earned the right to call your judgment true or false. Yeah. Even though it's still a, the application of a passion, not a, not a reason, it's a desire, not a belief, if you like, um, you've still earned the right. I can say you're not too happy about that, and to be honest, I'm not either. Um, but many people are, and Simon Blackburn's written a fantastic book called Ruling Passions. Um, it's not like his other books. It's not a, um, um, a popular book. It's, it's, it's a book for professionals, but if, if you can bear it, it's a very good book to read. Ruling Passions, it's called. Um, so, even though moral judgments are expressions of passion, not reason, the passions they express are so informed by reason that they almost attain the status of beliefs. And the passion is still central because if it wasn't, these judgments wouldn't be motivating. And if they weren't motivating, they wouldn't be moral at all. Because we've seen that if, if in order to be moral, a judgment has to be motivating. So, if moral judgments express passions, then right and wrong can't be properties that actions have independently of the way we feel about them. Um, but this doesn't mean that Hume isn't a realist. OK, we're getting onto the metaphysics now, and we've, we've got a very short time, but we're getting onto the metaphysics of non-cognitivism, the metaphysics of morality, according to Hume. He believes that moral properties are so-called secondary properties. 
And secondary properties are like colour, um, for example, as opposed to shape. shape. The shape of an object is a primary quality of an object. Its colour is a secondary property. Let's see what we mean by that. If you're asked what redness is, I should have brought these in and actually asked you without. In fact, let's... OK, what's redness? Now, you've had a quick look. And now you're not going to be able to bring it out from your intuition because you're trying to remember what I wrote. But well, what do you think redness is? Secondary. You mean the secondary quality? Redness. No, forget about secondary qualities for a minute. Just tell me what you think redness is. Go on. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surface which reflects light at a specific wavelength. OK. You, you think that it's a surface that reflects light at 650 uh, nanometers. Yes. Um, just fill in a bit of detail there. I'm very proud of myself it about that. Um, passion and, and, and energy and, and life. Uh, no, you're thinking of meaning in a metaphorical sense here. I, I'm actually asking what redness means rather than what it... Yes, because in China it means bridal, um, whereas here it means danger, perhaps. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that's not what I mean, but so... more. Than, it's an experience. Okay, you, so you think it's, it's a subjective experience, the, the sort of experience you have when... Ah, there's nothing red in here. Yes, there you are. When we look at... What's your name? Ian. When we look at Ian's thingamabob, <laughs> we, um, we have a certain experience, and we call that experience red. That's what you're saying. Okay, good. Anyone have any other idea? Okay. Well, let's see what's wrong with both of those. Um, OK, here's, here's the three I had. So this is yours, OK? And, it's, uh, and you're saying that redness is an entirely subjective state. Because actually, when, when I look at Ian's um, collar, um, I might be seeing what you see when you look at my cardigan, don't you think? Mm -hmm. OK, you think that? So to you, redness is a totally subjective experience. Not totally, but most well, OK, it's, it's an experience and it's one that's private in principle to each of us, OK? Whereas you think that, uh, that redness is the appearance... Uh, sorry, the wavelength of light emitted by objects or, or the surface of an object that emits light at a certain wavelength. It, it, you have to experience it, I mean, you know. I okay. mean, you, you, unless you see it, you, you don't have the term red. I mean, no, you don't, you don't have yeah. the experience. No, let, OK, let's, I've only got ten minutes, so I'm going to cut across both of you. Um, let's see what's wrong with uh, the first answer. Implies that red refers to an experience that's essentially private. But notice uh, we've all taught children the meaning of the word red, haven't we? we all, what do we do? We point to lots of red things uh, and, and we hope that the red things are different. You know, we, we don't point to collars every time. That would, that would be a bad idea. Uh, we point to lots of red things and we say, that's red, that's red, that's red. Now, if redness were the private experience of the child, yes. how would we ever know whether the child had the word right? Because well, what we then say is, is, well, hang on. We then say, is that red? We say, pointing to a blue thing and hoping the child's going to say, no, of course it's not, mummy. Um, and, and then we point to a red thing and we say is that red and we wait for the child to say yes in other words we hope we we're waiting for the child to pick up um the truth conditions of the sentence it's red and so it recognizes it's true when it's true and it recognizes it's false when it's false well how can we do that when we can't see what it's experiencing we have no idea what the child's experiencing no, we would know it was colourblind because then it wouldn't make the distinctions between colours that we do. And that's actually what, what, the, uh, what we're going on. When that child is saying of the colour that we see as red, that it's red, we'll say it's right. And when it's saying of a colour that we experience of not red, that it's not red, we'll say it's right again. Do you see what I mean? So it can't be the entirely private experience what we're hoping what we're relying on is that there is an experience there that's that's true we absolutely need that but what the experience is actually drops out of the picture um it, it cannot because otherwise we can't know whether the child's got it right or, it right or not um so redness isn't the essentially private experience although it seems clear that an essentially private experience is needed. 
for someone to, to acquire the concept red. Now, let's see why you're wrong, sir. OK. Um, oh, OK, I'm sorry, go, just going on here. So um, if redness were entirely private experience, we couldn't tell whether we were talking about the same colour at all, could we? If, if it's only true that it's red when it's that colour, the colour that I see and you can't see where, how I'm seeing it, we wouldn't know we were talking about the same colour and we couldn't teach the meaning of the word red to anyone. And as we can do both these things, this is not the right account of redness. Now, let's see why you're wrong. Um, so, Chris. Chris, thank you. You told me that earlier. I'm sorry, I forgot. OK, the second answer implies that were a cosmic ray to change the wavelengths of light associated with redness um, without changing our experiences. So overnight, something happens to this world so that all these chairs um, no longer reflect light at whatever blue is. Should have looked that up, shouldn't I? Um, so they appear red to us, but they're still reflecting light. Um, sorry, they still appear blue to us, but they're still reflecting light at what they... Um, get this wrong. Let's start again. They still appear blue to us, but they're no longer reflecting light at the wavelength they're reflecting it today i.e. the one that we, is normally associated with blue. Would we say that the chairs were the same colour or not? I mean, this actually occurs if you view certain things under so I don't light. care whether it's a... <laughs> yes. We're philosophers here. Yes, but you would say, you would say that that is measurably blue because you could do the calculation. OK, let me ask you again. The, the chair appears the same, but it reflects light differently. Has it changed colour or not? In other words, does the idea of same colour go with the way the chair appears to us or the way it reflects light? Yes, it does for a scientist or a philosopher. Uh, no, I don't think it does. What would the scientists say if suddenly blue chairs started reflecting light differently? They wouldn't say they'd change the colour. They'd say that the wavelength of light associated with blueness has changed. I'm sure they would. We don't have time to carry on about this, but you think about that. Um, I, I think we'd, we'd, colour would always go with our experiences. But notice you've, you've, abs you've got to have um, the objective um, property in the object as well. The true uh, account of colour is the um, third one. Redness is the appearance that certain objects have when seen by normal people under normal circumstances. So because red things, uh, well, we would almost certainly think the explanation of why normal people under normal circumstances <laughs> see um, Peter's collar, yeah. uh, sorry, Ian's collar in the way we see it is because it's reflecting light at 650 nanometers. That's the explanation of why it appears that way to normal people under normal circumstances. So redness is something that emerges from the interaction between our visual systems and objects that reflect light in a certain way. This other property emerges, but you have to have our visual system and the objects and light being reflected in a certain way. But once you have those two things, you've got a secondary quality. Um, you've got a quality that isn't objectively in the object quite independently of us, but it's also not entirely subjective, nothing to do with the world out there. It's actually to do with the interaction between our subjective experiences and the world as it is in itself. And when you get something that emerges out of the interaction between those two things, you've got a secondary quality. And, the, and Hume's answer, um, hang on, I've now lost my way. Uh, I'm going to give up on this. <laughs> um, OK, so Hume's thought is that morality is a property that emerges out of the interaction between normal human sympathy or empathy and the way the world is. And put the two together and you get morality. So morality, rightness and wrongness are secondary properties, a bit like colours. 
They're not primary qualities. They're not in the actions quite independently of our feelings about the actions, but nor are they just entirely in us independently of the way the world is. Morality brings both into the picture. Rather satisfying, I think, that one. Yeah, but is it... Is oh, it, yeah, but... Well, I'm just wondering, <laughs> I, I sort of sense that there's a bit of a problem there. Oh, God. Because it's social... Although socially we may agree that it's blue, and you're saying, well, yeah, but it's an interaction with whatever's happening there as well. But socially, our governments do... Uh, can make it our best interest to continue to see that, even if something else changes. The reality changes in the world. Yes. The world is not absolute. <laughs> I mean, we may see some I'm sorry, we're, we're going, I'm, I'm not going to go back to absolute and relative. Do, I'm very happy to answer a question on that, but go back and have a look at what we said in the first oh, well, week, um, because I, I think it's quite important you look at that and then we'll look at it again. It might be, I mean, if you look at the idea that colour is not a subjective property, it's, a, it's as objective as we can get. In other words, it's intersubjective. Um, redness emerges from normal, the, the way things appear to normal human beings under normal circumstances. So if you're not a normal human being, um, you're colourblind or something, then, then you don't count in the determination of whether something's red or not. And if the circumstances are normal, if, the, if I've put red foil or something over a light bulb, then again, our beliefs about what's red or not just don't count. But if you've got normal people in normal circumstances, then they will classify the world in the same way as each other. They'll put red things in one pile, green things in another pile, blue things in another pile, and it's that sameness that, that means they're seeing the same colour. Even if, most unlikely, but even if, Actually, we all see a different thing. We all have a different experience when we look at the red pile. Um, it's, we'll never know if that happens, and therefore it doesn't matter. It just falls out. Wittgenstein says it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's not a something, but it's not a nothing either, the experience. So Hume is a realist, though he differs from Aristotle, um, who believed, I think, that moral properties exist in the world quite independently of us. For Hume, they don't exist in the world independently of us, but that doesn't make them entirely subjective. So this is, again, your way of testing whether you've understood what's been going on this week. This is the reading for next week. Um, and, and there's more there than you could possibly do. And as usual, you don't have to do any of it if you haven't got the time. And that's it. Ah. <laughs> OK. Can we take the vote again now? Oh, what, what was the vote for? Oh, yes, OK. Can we take the vote again? OK, who, who's, for Ar who's for Aristotle? Hands up. OK, and who's for Hume? OK, we've, we've sli slightly shifted. It, it was slightly for Aristotle before. It's slightly for Hume now. OK, next week, I hope you're all going to be for Kant. <laughs>